And uh, this is my last class in this series. Um, Lord willing, I'll do another one someday. And we've covered this book uh, in part, about half of it maybe, book, uh, Workbook for Deep Foundations, the book that I wrote, a workbook that I was encouraged to add. And uh, so it's been interesting. I uh, wouldn't start out the class. We're going to look at question number 181, and we can look up Matthew 7. And uh, Deep Foundations is what everything is based upon. It covers a lot of different areas, a lot of different subjects, and it's free today. This is Memorial Day weekend. Happy uh, Memorial Day weekend for everybody. And it will be uh, the book uh, Deep Foundations will be free on Amazon today and tomorrow. So if you want a free ebook, you're welcome to go there. It's also available in hardcover and softcover paperback. So the question is today that we're going to begin the class with is, spiritually speaking, can we identify the root by the fruit? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, we can. Uh, so let's take a look at Matthew 7, 15 through 20. Let's go ahead and start out with reading that. Yes, thank you. Now, for turning that uh, extra air conditioner down, um, makes a lot of racket and is distracting. Thank you. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ra they are raving wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistle? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit, good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Okay. Um, Jesus is identifying uh, the root of the fruit in reality in this passage. He is identifying that there are false prophets, but at the root of a false prophet is a false mindset, is uh, the old nature, basically. And that's what these uh, define in here as two different trees. Uh, there's a good tree that represents the divine nature. We have an illustration here. This would be the Holy Spirit in our heart, the divine nature. And a corrupt tree, which is our human nature. We went into these things in past classes, and they're consistent throughout the Bible. And uh, these two identifications are the identity of the species. The human nature identifies us as humanity, mankind. Our soul is a decision maker. Our soul is the person you are. And in our heart is a communication area. Uh, the Bible refers to it often as the mind, where thoughts come from, and is also where emotions come from. That's used in different ways in the Bible, but in this case, it is the source of information, basically. And things that are put in your heart are fed to your soul, and your soul makes a decision what to do about that. And if it's a lot of bad information, your soul is probably going to make bad decisions. So it's up to your soul to prepare and preserve what goes into your heart as being good things from the divine nature, from light and not from darkness. And we're going to get into that a little bit today. Uh, let's take a look at, first of all, the fruit, Galatians 5, 19 through 23. Both of these will produce fruit. And uh, the two natures will identify the kind of fruit that the soul will produce. And in reality, the soul is the one that produces the fruit, but the nature identifies what kind of fruit that's going to be. If you're connected to the old nature, fallen sinful nature, your fruit's going to be bad. The soul's going to bear bad fruit. If you're connected to the divine nature, the Holy Spirit, your soul is going to produce good fruit. And they're listed here. There's a short list. And one thing I'd like to mention in this previous passage in Matthew, it says that these things will not enter the kingdom of God, won't enter heaven. Well, that's the old nature. He's not going to make it. He's destined for the lake of fire because he's kin to Satan. He's uh, never going to change. The old nature never changes. It's uh, desperately wicked. It contaminates our heart, it contaminates our soul, contam contaminates our world. This was a perfect earth at one point, perfect world. It's no longer perfect because of the fallen human nature. That won't happen to heaven because it's not allowed in. But your soul is allowed in. So the people that practice these things doesn't mean that their soul is condemned. 
But what is motivating your soul is condemned and will be removed. And we got into that in previous classes. It happens at the judgment seat of Christ. When your sinful nature is removed from us, and none of these things make it. Only the identity of the things done in Christ will make it, and we will make it if we have Christ in our heart. We got into that in previous classes as well. That's how salvation works. It's simply us, the Holy Spirit of Christ, into our heart. We become a new creation at that point. So the new identity, we actually become a new species, the child of God. So let's go ahead and take a look at these two fruits we actually have in this lifetime to deal with. Two different uh, natures, human nature, divine nature, and how they produce different activities. Galatians 5, 19 through 23. Let's go ahead and read that. The acts and the sinful nature are obvious. The sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, uh, dis uh, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, general, gentle, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. So once again, we look at the two different fruits here, two different natures here. And the, the divine nature is our new identity. That's who we actually are. That's how God sees us. And the old nature, the simple person, the old man, will be even removed before we get into heaven. That's how we're perfected. So that's what it's referring to here. It's not referring to if we stumble and sin into these things, that we miss heaven. If uh, you're a perfect preacher almost for most of your life and you stumble into lying, lying is mentioned as one of the bad things that don't enter into heaven. Or you stumble into some of these other things that are mentioned here. Do you miss heaven? Not according to God. Uh, not according to the Bible. A lot of people believe that, and they even use verses like this to say that. Now that person, that identity doesn't make it into heaven. But the soul, once you have a union with the Holy Spirit, he'll never leave you. That means that even if you resist him and don't listen to him, he's still with you, and he's going to heaven. And if he will never leave you, that means you're going to heaven too. The question is, do you have that union? Once you have it, it's eternal. It's solid. You have eternal life at that point. Eternal life means that you have life in heaven with God. So that's a key thing to keep in mind. And all these things can be explained in the book Deep Foundations clearly with all the Bible verses to support and to help expose some of the false ideas that are out there. As this is, there's many false prophets, many false theologies that are not according to the Bible. We have went in a number of those. And we've exposed them as obviously not according to the Bible. And how do they survive? Well, there's a deceiver out there. He's the one that promotes these things. He's the one that promotes darkness, confusion, and getting away from the Word of God and man-made theologies. And uh, so it's not always easy to recognize the root by the fruit because sometimes it hasn't developed yet. Sometimes, you know, and it's very hard to actually see the root of the situation sometimes without having our eyes open and clearly understanding the situation. Even then, it's pretty hard to see clearly. God has to actually open our eyes to certain things and decisions. We all make mistakes. But no matter what, God will always lead us into truth. That's one key thing. If this is leading us into truth, there's a good chance it is the Holy Spirit. It is God. And we see that. At, let's look at John 16, 12-13. So if it's regarding truth and love, then it's uh, probably the Holy Spirit. Now, there's some cases where it may be regarding truth and gossip. That's probably not the Holy Spirit. That's a little different type of truth. That's truth arranged to destroy somebody or to, you know, get you off track of walking in love. So there's a combination going on there. So, but let's take a look at truth is key. Truth is foundational. Uh, John 16, 12 through 13. Let's go ahead and read that. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you in, into all truth. He will not speak of will not speak on his own. 
He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. So he's called the Spirit of Truth, right? Okay. So that's one of his main identities. So uh, the Spirit of Truth is going to lead us into truth, and God's going to reveal things on a progressive uh, manner as we can handle it. He's not going to lay on us a bunch of stuff that we can't even understand yet because we don't have the basics. We've got to start with the basics, understanding in the Bible, and understand God is good, the devil is bad. That's the most basic thing there is. And we, if we understand that, then we move on to, well, just like John 10, 10 says, the devil came to kill, or it says the thief, but it's referring to the devil, kill, steal, and destroy. Well, if it's in category of killing, stealing, destroying, then it's his category. And God, uh, Jesus came to give us life and more abundantly. So that's a, that's a good thing to keep in mind that God is good, the devil is bad. The devil is very deceptive. He's a master of deception. So let's take a look at 1 John 1, 4. So it's difficult to, we've uh, supposed to be defining good and evil in this world since we ate back in the Garden of Eden, starting with Adam and Eve, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But it's not always easy to define, well, this is good, that's evil. And there's what looks to be gray areas a lot of times. Well, it's good sometimes, or maybe it's okay, it's not good or bad. But the bottom line is, there are two forces in this world, light and darkness, two kingdoms at war with each other, and we're in the midst of conflict. Let's take a look at 1 John 1. I did that almost again. 1 John 4, 1. I did this um, back in the, it was my dyslexia video, and I, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, something else. But nevertheless, it comes to mind automatically, maybe. I don't know. But nevertheless, 1 John 4, 1. Let's read that. Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone, have gone out into the world. Okay, we've got to test the spirits. Now, it's actually talking about this here. You could be a good person, walking in good Christian, but no matter what, you've got to test what spirit is motivating that moment. Just like we looked at Peter talking to Jesus and saying, you know, not agreeing with Jesus and saying, this ain't going to happen. It's not going to be like you say, Jesus. Well, that wasn't of the Holy Spirit who was actually with Peter, not in Peter at the moment. But nevertheless, uh, he's in us and we got an option. Our soul has an option. And sometimes we don't even recognize who's motivating us even when it happens. And Peter thought he was doing good. He thought he was being a leader. He thought he was going to take charge and and redirect this whole situation. And he had that intention, but it wasn't a godly situation. It was actually, as Jesus pointed out, it was the devil. And he pointed it out. He says, Satan, get behind me, looking straight at Peter. So we got to define, you know, what spirit is motivating these things? Even from buddies, even from closest friends, that find out, is this really God? Or is this just kind of their opinion, you know, or whatever the case may be, or even worse. Let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 11, 14 and 15. Satan is very deceptive. And uh, the first thing we need to do is realize that. 2 Corinthians 11, 14 through 15. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not a surprise, it is not surprising that if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness, their end will be what their actions deserve. Okay, so Satan masquerades as an angel of light. You would think if you've seen an angel of light, that's a good guy, you know? Obviously, he's, he's got some information for me to follow. And I've kind of been there back then when I was 19. Uh, well, actually, I was 20 by then, just turned. And before I was baptized in water and really dedicated my life to God. But nevertheless, uh, he can make himself real and look really good. And sometimes people actually follow there's satanic religions out there that actually glorify him. But he's very deceptive. He doesn't want to look like he's the evil guy. He actually makes a practice of making good things look bad. So he'll take some preachers that are actually trying to do something good and make them look bad. That's common for him. So when you see that, kind of recognize where that's probably coming from. And he'll also make bad things look good. He does it. That's deception. That's what he does. That's what he always does. He, he's constantly in the process of making bad look good and making good look bad. Makes God look bad and him look good. I mean, teenagers think that a lot. I thought that, uh, you know, drugs were good for a while. 
You know, I realized after a while, drugs will kill you, you know, and they'll destroy your brain. So uh, he will do that in the end. That's his, uh, his uh, desire is to destroy us. But he starts with planting seeds in our heart. It starts with a seed planted in our heart, an idea, a thought, a little thing. It's from him, though. It's a little thing of darkness. Let me ask you a question on that. Uh, for instance, kind of thing. Um, is someone a thief before they, thief, they steal something? Or are they a thief after they steal something? After. Before. Before? Before, after. before the thought. Okay, let's, let's take a, well, before, after, what? It's the thought that makes it before. You're right. That, that is actually the answer. Because, see, a thief is a thief before he steals something. Because if he wasn't a thief before he stole something, and he was an honest person, he wouldn't take it. See, honest people don't steal, even if it's the first time. I remember the first time I shoplifted something, I was a little kid, and I, I uh, thought, you know, let's see if I can get away with it. Well, it was in my heart first, you know. I thought, I'll try it. I got busted, got caught. Happened to walk across the street with uh, the store manager, a little small town, there comes my dad. Got things worse and worse. So I didn't become a thief. Real quick, I learned a lesson there. And uh, that's better if we learn lessons early. But it starts in our heart. And our lesson has to be to guard our heart. Because a thief is first a thief in his heart. Let's take a look at Matthew 5, 27 through 28. The activity of the action started from a seed in the heart, whether it's good or bad. And uh, so that's, uh, that's a key to realize that these actions, they have a root. The action is simply the fruit. But the root is coming from one of these two natures, more than likely. So uh, let's take a look at Matthew 5. And we just read the, the uh, fruit of the different kinds of fruit from the two different natures. Let's take a look at Matthew 5, 27 through 28. Matthew 5, 27 through 28. Go ahead and read that. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery within her already in his heart. So that's what Jesus is saying. It really starts in the heart. And that's the problem. Jesus is looking at our heart. He's recognizing these things. We're going to be judged from what we allow to grow in our heart. Now, we can't stop every bad thought and every bad seed from coming into our heart. But we can guard them to realize, well, I'm not going to let that grow. That's going to create a dark area in my life. That's going to put me down in a tailspin of depression or anger or whatever the case may be. And I decide, well, I'm not going to follow that and meditate on that. I'm going to meditate on something better. So um, that's the key to judge ourselves rather than judging other people. Let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 11.31. So we should be slow to judge others. Now there's times when we've got to judge and realize, you know what, I can't go hang with them. They're not going the direction I need to go. And you make a judgment. You're not condemning them necessarily unless you're actually trying to help them. And you realize that path is going to destroy you. And you're trying to actually help them. But we're not other people's judge. God is everybody's judge. But we need to judge ourselves and we need to judge our situations and who we're going to hang with, who we're going to listen to. And, uh, but it all comes down to ourselves, judging ourselves. What's in our heart? First Corinthians eleven thirty one. Let's go ahead and read that. Well, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. So that's the key. And that, that's throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament that the Bible says, you know, basically it's up to us first. But if we don't judge ourselves, eventually <laughs> judgment will come to us in one form or another. So what we sow, we will reap eventually. But if we change our path, then maybe we don't have to have all the negative circumstances. Or on, a, on the other side, if we change our path and believe the path that is good and go the negative way, we may miss blessings that we could have had. So it's our decision. We're responsible for what we make uh, uh, happen in our heart, what we allow to stay in our heart, what we decide to meditate and think about, what we actually take action about. Let's take a look at uh, 1 John 2. 1 John 2. 
So we need to recognize the real enemy is not us as far as our soul, our personality, our position in life, or those around us. It's really the nature, the human nature, simple nature within us. That is the enemy. That he does constantly put stuff in our heart that we've got to uproot and we've got to reconsider. Is this a good path? Let's take a look at 1 John 2, 9 through 11. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there is nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded him. Now it's pretty plain there, but a lot of people miss it. You know, and uh, as the one Pharisee said, who's my brother? Well, that's your neighbor in many mm -hmm. cases, mm -hmm. as the Bible illustrates. And uh, hatred is a darkening thing. Uh, you know, I heard a good uh, quote now, uh, if I can recall it right off the top of my head. Oh yeah, I remember how it went. Uh, it, it, basically it was, uh, um, anger is like poison that you take and expect the other person to die. You know, anger and bitterness is something that we gotta avoid because it poisons our personality. And uh, it's not making the other person any better or worse has often little effect on them, unless you're, you know, right next to each other or something. But nevertheless, uh, anger is something that we got to be careful with. As it says here, it puts us in darkness. And then we stumble. Let's take a look at uh, Luke 11, 35. So anger is a key thing. It's one of the things that dominates a lot of problems in our world, is anger. Most of the terrorists are motivated by anger. Luke eleven thirty five. And Jesus answered and said, while he taught in the temple, how they described the Christ as the son of David. Now hold it. Is that Luke eleven thirty five? Okay, that's a, that's a little different. <laughs> All the word of God is good, but sometimes it's uh, easier to understand if we take it in line. Go ahead and read it if you got it. Luke eleven thirty five. See to it then that the light within you is not darkness. So that's the thing. We may think we're walking in the light. But if we have anger and bitterness against somebody, we're really not. So we have to look at that. We have to take a look. Am I really not walking in love and light? And if I'm not, then I'm walking in darkness and deception, basically. We don't know we're deceived until the truth comes out. We recognize, oh, wow, Santa Claus isn't real. And we realize, wow, that's a silly thing to believe in in the first place. Well, that happens a lot of places, a lot of times, you know, when you rec recognize, well, Jesus didn't die on Good Friday. What? Well, you no, know, he died on Wednesday, Preparation Day. The whole Bible supports that. We went into classes about that. So we got to see these things clearly, the truth, and then recognize, do we need to make a change? Yeah, if we want to walk in the light, you need to make a change. You need to avoid the anger. You need to make decisions that are based on truth. When you find something that's not accurate, you move on to something that is accurate. It's like building a wall, and you take out that brick that's not accurate, that's crumbling under pressure, and you put in a rock that won't change the Word of God. So anyhow, let's go ahead and take a look at Proverbs 4. Proverbs 4, and we're going to look at 18 through 27. So we need to examine our heart. We need to consider our path, our associations, where we're getting our information, what we're meditating on. Is it really benefiting us or somebody else? Or is it actually from the dark side? Proverbs 4, 18 through 27. Let's go ahead and read that. Like the path of the just is as a shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. My son, attend to my words, and find not ear to you on my statements. Let them not depart from thine eyes, keep them in the midst of their hearts. And for all are wise unto those that find them, and have to all of their, to all of their flesh. Keep their heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. 
And that's an important statement. Let's go ahead and read on down to 27, a little more conclusion on that. But it's already pointed out that light grows. Yeah. It's a growing process. As we get more light, we see things more clearly. But we have a choice. And we start to garden our heart. Out of the heart comes the issues of life. Are we gardening it from the old man, the old nature, and the other things that are in this world that would pollute us, that would uh, darken our path? Let's go ahead and read up to 27. 24. Put away from me the forward mouth and reserve lips, but far from me. Let an eye look right on, and let thine eye, eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the paths of thy feet, and let all the ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. Remove thy foot from evil. So that's a choice that we can make. And uh, a lot of people think, well, that's a straight and narrow, you know, it's so narrow-minded and stuff. Uh, there's so much out there. Well, there is so much out there on the straight and narrow. Uh, it is the best, freest path. But the idea is it's balanced. When you turn to the right, then you're right wing. When you turn to the left, you're left wing. And you tend to be out of balance in the extremes. The Bible is not into the extremes, but into a perfect balance of all these things that are confronting us. How do we keep them in the proper perspective? Not to get carried away, not to get into the extremes, not to get to the right, to the left, but instead be on balance, on target, on the straight and narrow path, which it is narrow in some ways. It doesn't take much to get you off balance. It's a, it's a situation just like a scale. If it's balanced, you throw another little penny on there. It's not in balance no more. It's just a penny, but it's out of balance. So let's go ahead and move on. Any questions on that so far? Okay. Then uh, let's look at Philippians. Uh, let's look at uh, Philippians four, six through eight. So we need to look at what needs to be improved, what needs to be uprooted. Well, to be even balanced, we don't want to be obsessed with those things. I mean, some people get obsessed with Satan's under every rock. Demonic forces are everywhere, and they are everywhere, and they are doing a plenty. But you can get out of balance with that real fast. And uh, what you're looking at, you tend to walk towards. That's why it says to look straight ahead. Just like when you're driving. If you're driving, you wonder how so many people get hit on the side of the road. Well, the driver's looking at them. And then they drive right at them. And that's how they get hit. Because you tend to drive where you're looking. Now, you can look around a little bit and be aware of your surroundings. But when you focus and actually uh, get into really obsessing over something, that's the direction you're tending to go. Even if, even if it's not a direction you want to go. But nevertheless, uh, so we got to be in balance. We don't need to focus. We need to be aware of things that we need to uproot, things we need to grow in and improve. But we really need to focus on things like love and truth. That's really where we need to really practice our planting in our heart. And it's an active thing that we want to water love and truth. We want to plant love and truth. We want to do that in our society, in our environment. And uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. Philippians 4, 6 through 8. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, by thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, Whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. So that's a that's a good list. Actually, that's a list we should all have kind of marked in our Bible, Philippians four eight, and uh, just kind of think about these things. And kind of sometimes uh, when you're having problems in your mind and you're thinking a lot of negative thoughts, dark things are happening, whether depression or anger, I mean, kind of read over this list more than once. You know, maybe even post it up there and just kind of think. I got to redirect the thinking on that, you know, instead of this. And as you're so full of that, you have no room for this because your glass is only so full. You can only put so much in it. So you got to divide up, well, am I going to have more of that or more of this? Is the glass half full or half empty in a sense? Well, I'm going to look at it as half full. And it's a decision we make. Instead of what I'm missing, it's what I have. And God's blessed me with. We need to focus on the good things. And uh, that's not a bad thing to do. That actually gives you a better attitude, more gratefulness, more thankfulness. And uh, that's what God wants us to walk in. Gratefulness, thankfulness, joy, love. That's part of the fruit of the Spirit. 
So uh, he's provided those things. He wants us to recognize his provisions, his good gifts to us. Any questions on that so far? Okay, let's go ahead and we're going to close with, uh, in this question at least, and we're about out of time, so we'll probably close. But nevertheless, uh, the main thing to test the spirits is uh, one of the things, which one of, we're connected to, and uh, the old nature and new nature. Let's take a look at John 15, 2. Is our we obeying Jesus' word? Now, some people can get legalistic about this, and the whole Bible, they can get legalistic about, well, I'm, I'm obeying all the laws. And uh, Jesus was dealing with that with the Pharisees sometimes, and uh, different uh, situations, how he was uh, trying to put things in perspective, because you can get out of balance with that. And uh, just getting all legalistic, as they say, and uh, missing the heart of the matter. Uh, but let's take a look at John 15, to 12. Uh, now it's okay, it's good to obey the laws, obviously. If I break the law, then I'm subject to a penalty. But uh, it's best to kind of keep these things and know what the true law, what's really important is. So let's take a look at it. John, the, the true commandment that Jesus pointed out. John 15, 12. Go ahead and read that. This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. So he, he made that like singular. This is, if we want to know Jesus' commandment, right there it is. He says, uh, as a matter of fact, let's take a look at Mark 12, 30 and 31. It, it kind of boils down to being simple. And he illustrated that if we don't walk in that, we're walking in darkness. Because if we're angry with our brother, we're not loving, we're bitter, that's darkness. And so that's not where he wants me to be. So uh, let's take a look at Mark 12. 30 and 31. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So these uh, basically are both and both love. I'm directing that if you love God first, you're in better perspective, have better balance. And because uh, if you love people in front of God, sometimes they'll misdirect you. It happened with Eve and Adam. Uh, it happens occasionally. But if we love God first, and then love everybody else second, then there's plenty of love to go around. So uh, that's the main commandment. It uh, says everything else hangs on these. These are the main two commandments. These are what it's all about. Let's take a look at James 2.8. If you keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. So God refers to it as a royal law here. It's the law of the kingdom. It's the law that's going to be practiced in heaven constantly. And uh, so any questions on that? And uh, that is uh, the conclusion of that question. Um, this being our last class, I could end on that positive note. Uh, Yes? You know, what I was thinking is like, uh, you know how like you hear, um, you know, whenever you're, you get into an argument or uh, you're feeling like Ugh, frustrated, you should count to 10. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking that's kind of like what you need to do because you need to make sure you, because I always think it's plug in, you know, do I want to plug into yeah. self yeah. And, and get my revenge or do I want to plug into the Holy Spirit and let the Holy Spirit take over and you know, speak love through me even if somebody is coming at me and trying to attack me or hurt me or trying to make me feel bad. But sometimes I guess that's what I try to think of is like I'm plugging in to right. which, which one do I want to plug into? That's a, that's a good point, good illustration. You're right. And uh, so I had a thought of flipping it from me. And it's easy to do. I mean, in traffic alone, you can be out there and all of a sudden there's some silly drivers out there and they can make you have bad thoughts for a moment. But you can't be uh, practicing those. That's what called, they call road rage. And we don't need that. So uh, that's a good point. Thank you, Sweeney. Absolutely. Thank you, Marcia. Mm -hmm. And uh, any other thoughts or questions as we uh, think we'll conclude today? Okay.
then uh, we're going to go ahead and close on that and uh, go ahead and thank you for all uh, coming to the internet. Check out the book. It's free today and tomorrow. God bless you all.